good morning, everyone. I uh, count it an honor and a blessing to have an opportunity to be with you all this week. And um, if somebody were to say to me, hey, Bill, what do you do for a living? Matter of fact, why don't you just ask me that? I hang out with people and I keep it real with them and I ask them to keep it real with me. Amen? Amen. Now, how many of you want me to be real? Raise your hands. Okay, if I'm willing to be real, how many of you are willing to be real? Raise your hands. Okay, we're going to find out in a few minutes about that. Um, We're going to talk a lot to each other. Let me lay down some rules. We're going to talk to the person seated next to us. The person seated next to you is your neighbor. So just say, good morning, neighbor. Say, neighbor. I'm going to be real with you today. Now, now the men that were at the men's retreat know exactly what I'm talking about, where I'm going. But Ephesians 4.25 says, cease then with lying and tell your neighbor the truth. Because we're not separate units, but intimately united in Christ. I think that's God's way of saying be real with each other. Amen? Amen. Okay, and then I'm going to have you hand, raise your hand and confess some of the sin that's in your life. <laughs> Say neighbor. neighbor. Oh, don't act like there's not sin in your life. James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another, then pray for each other that we can be healed. What does God not say? He doesn't say you don't have sin, though John writes, I write these things to you that you don't sin, but if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But James says, hey, if you got some stuff going on, confess that to somebody and have them pray for you so that you can move on with your life. Amen? Amen. So let's just get ready. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Let me see how real you're going to get before I get real. Here's what I need you to do, first of all. I want you to take your hand and point it at me. And I want you to say it with authority. Say, Bill, Bill. take that stupid blazer off. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Now, I was going to take it off, whether you asked me to take it off or not, but now it's free. Okay. By the raising of your hands, how many of you have found out life's a lot more difficult than you thought it would be? How many of you have found out serving Jesus is a little bit more difficult than you thought it would be? How many of you find yourself doing stupid stuff every once in a while? How many of us do stupid stuff? We know it's stupid and we do it anyway. Look at the person next to you. Say, neighbor, what in the ham sandwich is the matter with you? And how many of us have one of these in our lives? Something that we've done, our attitude about it is, oh, my God, I hope no one ever finds out I did that. How many of us have one of those in our lives? Say, neighbor, and I won't be telling you about it either. Okay. But God knows. And you know, there's a book written, I'm okay, you're okay. And the problem with that book is I'm not okay and you're not okay, and that's okay because Jesus came to deal with people who weren't okay. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so that's where we're going to go. And not just a little commercial here. I wrote a book in case you're interested. I, I've got three to give away. I'm already going to give away one. It's called Hope on a Rope, Lifelines for Knuckleheads. Now, there's a line in the book that says it this way. There are only two kinds of people in the world, knuckleheads and people who think they're not knuckleheads. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I think that brother just called you a knucklehead. <laughs> and if we're really real, we can probably all admit, even by if you raised your hand just one of those times a couple of minutes ago, we're all knuckleheads, and that's okay. And God has begun this incredible work in our lives, and he is not going to stop until he's finished. The Bible also says, know those that labor among you. And, and just by way of testimony, I'll share a little bit about my own personal life, born and raised in New York City. Uh, Went to, uh, my mom was involved with organized crime. I didn't realize it was organized crime until many years later as a police officer, I began to investigate organized crime. And then I looked back, I was like, wow, that's what mommy used to do. And, um, and then I was a victim of child abuse at her hands. Didn't realize it was child abuse at the time. And then I began to investigate child abuse and I was like, wow, that's what mommy used to do. And I saw this girl at a Young Life camp, that ministry I work with, and she had a t-shirt on it said, save your drama for your mama. Look at your neighbor, say neighbor. Bill's mama was his drama. And, uh, and I had a cousin who lived in our house, and, and she was a very wild girl. She was very promiscuous. And uh, if you have to ask what promiscuous means, you don't need to know, okay? Uh, but I saw a lot of stuff that little boys shouldn't see. And when I was 13 years old, my mom dies of a massive heart attack. And the day that she dies, I find out that she's not really my mom. But the girl who I've been watching sleep around was my real mother. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Dang. You know, what do you do with that? What do you do with that when you don't know Jesus? What do you do with that when you don't know the God of the universe loves you and cares for you and wants to really uh, intervene in the affairs of your life? 
I didn't know that Jesus did, and my life spiraled out of control. Went to an all-boys high school. 7,000 boys went to my high school. I played football there. I was a real good athlete. And even had the opportunity to come to Staten Island and play football out here. And as far as I was concerned, this was the dark kingdom. And the first game we played was against Curtis High School. And we beat them boys like a drum. <laughs> and then we came to Darth Vader land, and we played against New Dorp. <laughs> and they beat us like a drum. <laughs> and so when I had the opportunity to come and speak to people of New Dorp, <laughs> what's your neighbor say, neighbor? neighbor? Get ready for the beating. OK, so, so no, not really. But as soon as football season ended my senior year, I quit school, began running the streets and hanging out with a gang that was kind of crazy and doing bank robberies and murder. And I joined the military to keep them going to jail, got married when I was in the service and uh, finished high school when I was in the service. And I got out and became a police officer. And they gave me a gun. They gave me a badge. I had tremendous authority, and, and, but I had no power in my life. And as a result of not having power in my life, I abused the authority that was given to me. And then uh, one day I got real. December 26, 1980 at 245 in the afternoon. I was watching TV and a man on television asked two questions. And he pointed at the screen and it was almost like he was in my house. He said, are you a sinner? And I said, yeah. He said, do you know Jesus? I said, no. Say neighbor. neighbor. You know, you got issues if you get an attitude with the television. <laughs> and he said, call this number. And that day I called the number and a man explained to me the incredible love of Jesus Christ. He didn't tell me anything I hadn't heard before. But the Bible says no one can come unless the spirit of God draws them. And that day, God turned the light on, and I prayed with that man, and I received Christ in my life. And by this time, I was an alcoholic. I was strung out on drugs. I was angry. I was violent. I was abusive. And instantly, I was filled with God's spirit and filled with this peace that I had never had before and a joy that I had never had before. My first wife, Claudia, came home from shopping. I met her at the door. I said, Claudia, this is new me. Jesus came into my life. I'm born again by the spirit of God. My name's written in the last book of life. I'm a new creation in Christ. Because that's all the stuff that man told me on the phone. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor. Never say stupid stuff to a black woman. <laughs> and uh, when, I, when I said that to her, she went, yeah, right. <laughs> but God had changed my life. And then he changed her life. And then he changed the lives of my son and my father at 83 years old. And God turned our entire household around. And then we began. We began this new creation relationship with Jesus. Now you've heard me say it was my first wife, and she left me for another man. And his name is Jesus, and she's with him now. Oh, yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. He needs to find a better way to explain that. <laughs> and so by God's incredible grace, he's given me a new wife, and she's seated here, and her name is Pamela. Pamela, stand up. Okay. I asked the Lord when Claudia died, I said, hey, can I, am I going to get married again or should I stay single and do ministry for you? And the Lord said, the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. And then the Lord said, especially you. <laughs> and so he gave me her. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor. neighbor. Thank God Almighty. Okay. And we have some friends visiting us for the weekend, Christy and Anna. Stand up there from Colorado. When he said, and he's here with his family. I thought, yeah, I got white people in my family. <laughs> and looking around, I got brown people in my family and yellow people in my family. And like, whoo, this, this, look at you, this, look around. Look around this congregation. Just everybody take a look around. Say, neighbor, neighbor. this is what heaven going to look like. Yeah. Multicultural. Yeah. Or maybe just mixed nuts. You never know, okay? So... But we're going to talk about life today. We're going to get real, and we're, we'll discuss some things. And, uh, you know, I, everybody take a look at this right here. It says, what's that word? What did your neighbor say, neighbor? neighbor? What kind of attitude do you have? How many of you have ever run into somebody with a bad attitude? Anybody ever have that happen to them? How many, as a result of your interaction with that person, all of a sudden, you had a bad attitude? You know, and they hook us. And, and so sometimes we go through life, and we don't know what to do, and how do we get beyond bad attitudes? And I think that God really wants, we heard our sister talk about having an impact here in Staten Island and in New York City, and then even going into a greater part of the world. And I really feel that God wants to do incredible things in our lives. 
that he might do incredible things through our life. Peter in Luke 5 gets real with Jesus when, when Jesus says, go fishing with Jesus. And then Peter realizes he's in the presence of someone much greater than himself. And he says to Jesus, get away from me. I'm sinful. And it seems like Jesus doesn't even hear what he says. Put your net down. Pick up your cross. Come on, follow me. And I'll teach you to catch men. And I think the unspoken word there is like, you hang out with me long enough, that sinful stuff will start to change. When we come to Jesus, we bring some baggage with us. How many of us have some baggage in our lives? These are not trick questions, ladies and gentlemen. How many of us have some baggage in our lives? Okay, so everybody do this right quick. These are your 3D spiritual glasses. They allow you to look into the spirit realm. Put your 3D glasses on. Yeah, he got a monocle. Okay, so, okay. Now look your neighbor up and down. Say neighbor. Oh, you got a lot more baggage than I thought you had. <laughs> and, and you know what it is, is that because in the church, we've yet to, to learn to be real. We've let, yet learned to be honest, to be vulnerable, to be transparent. And we act like we got it all together. And when you and I are doing that, we do other people a disservice. Because I was surrounded by a lot of people who acted like they had it all together, and I knew I didn't have it all together. And so as far as I was concerned, Jesus was working for them, but it wasn't working for me because they weren't real. And I tell you right now, I really do believe the world is looking for something that's real. And we have him, and his name is Jesus. Amen. They're looking for real in all the wrong places. And God wants them to find him in you as Jesus lives his life through you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, there was a book written by a guy named Francis Schaeffer, and I'm going to try to use notes, but I'm a little on the ADD side, so <laughs> I might just end up out there somewhere. Okay, he, he wrote a book then, how, shall then how, shall, how Then Shall We Live? How does God want us to live this thing out? You know, and, and he believed that God's word contained everything that was needed for us to live it out. And so how does God want us to do that? The 2 Corinthians 2.14 in one translation says, the spring of our action is the love of God. In other words, we live our lives responding to God's incredible love for us. Not so much about how much you love him, but because of how much he loves us. For the Bible says the love of God was demonstrated for you and I that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. And so now God calls us to live responding to that incredible love. In the economy of God, regardless of what you might think, regardless of somebody else might think, you and I were worth dying for. That is amazing to me. And as we respond to that, it goes on to say that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they become a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. We're in Christ now. God in us, living his life. God who opens us up through the power of the Holy Spirit, and this is in my own crazy imagination, opens you and I and climbs down inside of us and just says, now let me live my life through you. And the only thing that gets in the way of that is our flesh. Amen? Amen. Okay, so I wanna, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about attitude, okay? I've had a bad attitude. There have been times because of the anger, the abuse, the violence that I had suffered, you know, and then God calls me to be a minister, and I, I get a job at a place called Children's Village. Children's Village is a residential treatment center for emotionally disturbed boys. 300 boys out of homes of abuse and neglect. 300 boys out of a home just like my home. Some of those boys are from Staten Island. And I didn't realize how much baggage I brought when I came to Jesus. And so I thought I was going to go there to be the healer. And God was sending me there to be healed. Emotionally disturbed. Many people think that's a, a, a negative term. It's not negative. It's just real. Every single one of you are emotionally disturbed every once in a while. <laughs> Let me prove it. Everybody go like this. Let this represent your emotions. Your emotions can only go like this or like that. So everybody do that right quick. Just do that. That's all you can do is this. So right now, though, for the most of you, you're kind of calm. So I have to keep your hands like that. Now use your imagination. And I come over to you, and I just go in your face. Show me your emotions. Say, neighbor, you're emotionally disturbed. And so there's nothing wrong with being emotionally disturbed, but what do we do? Why are we emotionally disturbed? You know, we read the scriptures, it says, 
Be angry, but don't sin. I think we read it this way. Be angry, but don't you sin. I think God means it this way. Be angry, but don't sin. <laughs> if I spit on you, you have every right to be angry. Waiting for me to get in that crosswalk and then running me over with your car is like taking that to a whole nother level. How many of you have ever been angry at somebody? How many of you have ever been angry at somebody right here in this building? Anybody in the house? How many of you have decided somebody get on your last nerve? You're having a good time until they show up. You could be here speaking, and you know, I'm just talking. How many of us have ever been down that road? Say, neighbor. neighbor. Don't act like you don't know what that brother's talking about. In the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are chapters known as the Beatitudes. Ebonics, I looked up the word ebonics. It says, at its most literal level, ebonics simply means black speech, a blend of words, ebony meaning black, phonics meaning sound. So here we got the Beatitudes. So, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Well, what be your attitude? So Jesus has shown us a way. I like talking like that. I don't do it a lot because my wife is here. But you know what I'm saying? But when she ain't around. <laughs> okay, so, so here's the thing. But this is my translation, okay? Philippians 2.5 in the Philipp Philip's translation says it this way. Let Jesus Christ be your example as to what your attitude should be. I think that's God's way of saying, you really want to find out how to live life? Check out my son, Jesus. Listen to the things that he said. Watch the things that he did. And then pattern your life after him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Never forgetting that Jesus said in John 15 and 5, without me, you can't do anything. It's not about you sucking it up. It's not about you pulling up your bootstraps or your pantyhose or whatever your women do. Okay? But it's really about yielding and surrendering and submitting ourselves to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Uh, do they still make pantyhose? Yes? Okay. 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 So today we're going to talk about forgiveness. What is your attitude about forgiveness? How many of you have ever been hurt by somebody? How many of you realize that this is a lie? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. How many of us realize that words do a lot more damage than sticks and stones? How many of us realize the pain lasts a lot longer? I want us to think about some of these things that as we go forward. I, I go to Children's Village and I become this chaplain, associate chaplain. And as a result of this home that I came out of, my biggest issue would be with women. And God, in his incredible sense of humor, who does he give me for a boss? A woman, a white woman at that. And my attitude at the time was no woman tells me what to do, even though the Bible says be obedient to those in authority over you. And if I'm the associate chaplain and she's the chaplain, I have to surrender to her authority. Amen? Amen. In my Bible, it says, unless it's a woman, and I wrote that in there. <laughs> Say, neighbor, God ain't feeling that. And so we clash every once in a while. She doesn't know about my childhood. I've never thought about my childhood but God puts me around 300 little me's. And key fight words at Children's Village are these two words, your mama. Black kids, Hispanic kids, we know how to go there. Some Asian kids, white people don't play the your mama game too tough. But a black kid, Latino kid, like, yo, your mama's one. Then you get a couple of knuckleheads, ooh, you talk about your mama. Next thing you know, hooking and jabbing. White people are like, you're a mother. Well, that's not real painful. <laughs> Look at your neighbor say, neighbor, neighbor. Racial, racial, but not racist. Okay. So one day, she steps to me. And I'll never forget, she put her fist here, and she said, what kind of a mother did you come from? Scooby-Doo. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm pretty proficient in cutting people up verbally. And I just walked away from her, and I thought about it. And something incredible happened on that day. Now, I shared this with the men 
but the ladies weren't there. And ladies kind of like take anger to a whole nother level, stereotypically speaking. Ladies have a thing in them called, it ain't over. <laughs> ladies have total recall, total. Videotape replay wasn't invented for women. It was invented for men who forget stuff that happened five minutes ago. How many of you are here with your wife or your husband? How many couples we got in the house? Raise your hand. I'm getting ready to get you in some trouble. How many of you have ever had an argument with your wife? Anybody here? How many of you had an argument with her over something that happened so long ago that you forgot about it, but to her it happened yesterday? Has that ever happened to anybody? <laughs> Women don't forget anything, stereotypically speaking. Women stuff stuff. Women will go like, now, it doesn't mean men don't do this, but a woman will go, something else happened. Oh. Something else happens. And then one day it happens. <laughs> Doris was so nice until she killed everybody down at Whole Foods. <laughs> Just a thought. How many of you ever want to get even with somebody? You know, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, say it the Lord, I shall repay. My attitude towards that verse has been, don't trouble yourself, Jesus. I got this one, and I take care of myself. <laughs> How many of you tried to handle things yourself and only made it worse? <laughs> say, neighbor. neighbor. I hope you never ask this brother to come back here again. <laughs> I want you to think. How many of you have ever gone to bed angry? How many of you ever, like, cried yourself to sleep? How many of you ever had your head laying on that pillow, had a tear roll out your left eye, across the bridge of your nose down into your right eye? <laughs> Say, neighbor, neighbor, does this man know everything about you? <laughs> but how many of us, when we wake up in the morning, we're not as angry as we were when we went to sleep? Have you ever wondered, where'd the anger go? It doesn't go out the window. It doesn't go up the fire escape, or if you live in a house up the chimney, it goes downstairs. And then somebody pushes the right button, and we see a different side of you. When does the wolf man come out? What's in the sky when he comes out? Full, what kind of moon? Full moon. Daytime wolf man is chill. We'll make it, let's be gender specific here. Wolf man or wolf woman. They're chill in the daytime. Hi, Bob. Hi, Carol. How you doing? Sun goes down, moon comes up. Oh! Now the wolf man's on the prowl. What happens if you get bitten by the wolf man and you don't die? You turn into a wolf. How many of you have ever been mad at this person, but you couldn't do nothing about that person, and you took it out on that person? I mean, well, oh, just six of us? Praise the Lord. <laughs> How many of us have ever done that? Say, neighbor. Wolf man's disease. You've been bitten here? <laughs> Can't get there. And you chew up on that person. What does God want us to do? How do we handle this? Now, I'm saying this in a real light term so it'll be easily entreatable. But if what I share with you today aligns itself with God's word, you're responsible. I wish I had the ability to make you believe the things that I was going to say. I wish I had the ability to do the Jedi mind trick on all of y'all and just go like, you know you want to follow Jesus and do everything he said for the rest of your life. And you go, I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to do everything he said for the rest of my life. Say, neighbor. He doesn't have those kind of skills. The one skill that God has given me is to speak to people in a language that they can understand. You understand what I'm saying, whether you agree with it or not. But if it aligns itself with God's word, then you have to surrender to that. In Matthew uh, 5, Peter comes to Jesus. And you can read these for yourself, Matthew 5, 21. Lord, how many times I got to forgive my brother? He don't even wait for Jesus to answer. Seven times? Here's what I believe. I could be wrong. I don't think this is a rhetorical question. I think Peter's got beef with somebody. I think he's upset with somebody. And now he's coming to Jesus. And maybe he's already given him, forgiven him seven times. Now do I get a chance to get him, Lord? And Jesus says, no, not seven times, 70 times seven. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Don't ask questions that you don't want to know the answers to. 
How many of you have ever prayed a prayer like this? <sighs> Lord, I know I told you I wouldn't do that again. Say that again. Think that again. <sighs> I did it again. Please forgive me again. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer like that? How many of us? Learn to be real, folks. How many of us have ever prayed a prayer like that? How many of us have prayed that prayer so many times you've been waiting for lightning to come down from heaven and hit you in the back of the head? You're still here. And Jesus says, if you confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. No matter how many times we come. Now, sometimes there are consequences that come with that, but there's never a time that you and I have confessed something to Jesus that we haven't been forgiven. And then Jesus says, or well, the word of God says, let him be our example as to what our attitude should be. Every single one of us are the products of people who love us and people who've chosen not to love us. And most of all, God who loves us unconditionally. But there have been some people in our lives who have not loved us well. And as a result of that, that causes a certain attitude within us. There's some stuff that we carry that God wants to make an exchange through the spirit of God. That God wants to make us whole that God wants to release us and enable us to forgive, to forgive others. And I want us to think about that. And then Jesus, of course, gives the parable about the man who was forgiven such an incredible debt and refused to forgive somebody of a little debt. And somebody went back and told the one who would, the forgiver. And then that man got in some trouble. And when you and I refuse to forgive, it can get us in some trouble. When you and I walk around with bitterness and resentment or even hatred towards some people, it can get us into trouble. And we can pray about it, but nothing happened because the Bible says if a man or woman regards iniquity in their heart, the ears of the Lord are far from them. God would go like, mm -mm, we're not going anywhere until you deal with that. It's serious. And sometimes we walk around and we're upset. And you have every right to be angry. God doesn't take away our right to be angry or upset, but he does limit what he wants us to do when those things happen to us. In our homes, the way we entreat our wives, the way we entreat our children, the things that we say, the, the way that we handle them. You know, the Bible says the Lord chastens those that he loves. Many times we chasten our children and love has nothing to do with it. It's aggravation and frustration or the Popeye syndrome, I can stand on, I can stand and I can't stand no more. But the Bible also tells us, don't provoke your children to wrath lest they become discouraged. That stumbling blocks have to come, but woe unto those that would bring them, for it would be better for a millstone to be hung around their neck and they'd be thrown into the sea than you cause the least of mine to stumble. You've got to deal with your attitude. I'm going to share a little teeny weeny story. I was talking to somebody one day about the difference between forgiveness and I'm sorry. And I said, and this person, I had hurt that person. And they said, uh, I said, there's a difference between forgive me and I'm sorry. And here's what they said to me. You just want it in your little box. And this was my response, and I'm embarrassed to say, you need not come to me when service is over. God has already rebuked me. <laughs> say, neighbor. Oh, this is going to be good. Well, let's just get something straight. They don't invite me to speak all over the world because I don't know what I'm talking about. And then in the spirit realm, I heard the Holy Spirit say, hey, excuse me? Oh, it's about you now. And now I'm angry and frustrated. And I teach about forgiveness all the time. I'm on an airplane. The next day I'm reading Beth Moore's book, praying God's word. I love Beth Moore. Why? Because she's real. So I said, let me see what she's got to say about forgiveness. So I, I, she says, okay, when you're, one of the things she says, when you're angry at somebody, go to God and tattle on them. Like a little kid tattles. <laughs> he, he, he said this to me, Jesus. He treated me so mean. You go to Jesus. So I was at a conference the next day. The man is speaking. He wasn't speaking to anybody in this room. He wasn't speaking to the other people in that other room. The only person he was speaking to was me. And he was pinning me to the wall. And then at the end of the service, he said, I want to give you all a half an hour to go out and be with the Lord. And so here was my prayer. And you could do with this what you want. It's just me. I probably won't be back here. <laughs> I said, Lord, I want to talk to you about that person. And I want to use the F word, both of the B words and the S word. 
Don't you never say neighbor. neighbor. I'm surprised God didn't kill him right there. <laughs> and so am I. And so I walked out, I put my coat on, and I walked out of the house. And instantly I was in the presence of the Lord. And God's spirit began to flow through me. And when he finished doing what he did, the anger was completely gone. Two days later, I get an email from that person. Okay, I get it. There is a difference between forgive me and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. But he didn't deal with that person until he dealt with me. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it all starts with you. Because he's the one that began the good work. I cannot express to you enough the importance of being real with God, of being honest with God. I want you to think about that. There are some verses in the Bible that are incredible. And I just want to read some things to you. How do we live this thing? So Ephesians 4.21 in one translation says this. No, what you've learned is to fling off the old dirty clothes and the old way of living. See, the way that we lived before, that's not the way that we live now. Now we're in the kingdom of God. Now we're the children of God. God's spirit lives within us. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how far his ways and thoughts are removed from ours. So now we're this new creation. And so we don't operate the way that we used to. But those things were rotted through and through with lust illusions. And when I say lust here, let's just talk about lust being strong desire. Strong desire for the wrong thing. Strong desire to get even with somebody. You know, maybe some of you sit here today, you go like, you hear this and you know that forgiveness is the way out, but you go like, Bill, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what's happened to me. But the Bible says that we have this high priest who could be touched by all of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our hurts, our pains, because just like us, he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. There's a God who understands. There's a God who has the ability to empathize through its own experience. I'll come back to the verses. How many of you have ever been rejected by somebody? Anybody ever feel rejection? How many of you, when it happened, you were like, I don't care, but you know good and well you care. Anybody in the house? Okay. Jesus knows what it's like to be rejected. Jesus knows what it's like to be abused. Jesus knows what it's like to be lied on. Jesus knows what it's like to be violated. Jesus knows what it's like for his own father to turn his head from him, which is a very serious thing when it comes to our natural parents because Psalm 27 and 10 says, if your mother and father forsake you, the Lord himself will lift you up. God goes, if that gets messed up, I got to get involved in that. He understands. He's able to enter in with you. And he is the God of all comfort and mercy. And he gives us comfort in our trials. Why? So that we in turn can give comfort to others in theirs. And the more that we share Christ's sufferings, the more we are able to give his encouragement. The scripture goes on to say, this means that if we have to experience trouble, we can pass on to you the same sort of spiritual help that we ourselves have received. God leaves no stone unturned. God says the stuff that happens to you or has happened to you, bad. But because now you love me, I'll take those things and I'll work them together for good. They're not good. But because you love me, I'll work it together for good because you're called according to my purpose. So it says this. Get rid of the dirty clothes, rot it through and through with less illusions and yourselves mentally and spiritually remade to put on the clean, fresh clothes of the new life, which is made by God's design for righteousness and holy, which is no illusion. And then it goes on to say, back to Ephesians 4.25, finish them with lying. Tell your neighbor the truth, for we are not separate units, but intimately united to each other in Christ. If you're angry, be sure that it's not out of wounded pride or a bad temper. Never. Here's where God's word, ladies and gentlemen. Never go to bed angry. Why? Do not give the devil that kind of a foothold in your life. And I wonder how many of us have gone to bed over and over with unresolved stuff. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold. The new life means positive good. If you used to be a thief, you must not only give up stealing, but you must learn to make an honest living so that you may be able to help those in need. Here we go. Now we're upset about something. Let there be no more foul language. How many of us have ever had a curse word come out of our mouth since we've given our life to the Lord? How many of us? Again, one more time. Let me see. Okay. That bad boy didn't slip out. That bad boy glided out. Amen? Okay. Okay. It says this. Let there be no more foul language. 
but good words instead, words suitable for the occasion, which God can use to help other people. See, as sister was up here earlier, she was talking about other people. God is always thinking about other people because you're in. You're in the body of Christ. You're God's sons and daughters. And now God wants to help somebody through you. You're a light in a world of darkness. You're the salt of the earth that is not meant, meant to be trodden under the foot of men. But if the salt has lost its savor, what good is it for? And a lot of times we allow stuff to cause the salt to lose its favor. But God is in the replenishing game. And I want us to think about that. Never hurt the Holy Spirit or never grieve the Holy Spirit. He is, remember, your personal pledge of your eventual full redemption. And I'm going to come to this last verse. I share one story about my first wife and my youngest son. Claudia died coming up now on five years, four and a half years ago now. And uh, the day we went to the hospital to sign the do not resuscitate order, me and both of my sons, when we signed the paper, we said, how much time does she have? And they said, well, maybe 10 days. She died in an hour. Minute 58 of that hour, my youngest son goes and stands at her side. And he says these words, mommy, now she's in a state of delirium because her liver has shut down on her. Mommy, I want you to forgive me for the anger and the bitterness and the resentment I've held against you since I was a little boy. She comes out of the state of delirium, looks at him and says, I love you. Closed her eyes just like this. And she was in the presence of Jesus. What incredible closure. The last thing she ever heard was those words. The last thing he ever heard was his mom saying, I love you. And the joy of the Lord flooded the room. And we were driving home, I said to both of my sons, as we were really touched by this, I said, if you got beef against me, don't be waiting for me to lay on my deathbed. Let's get this straight now. Don't come climbing up into the bed then. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need to get it straight now. And maybe for some of us, our attitude could be, well, they don't deserve my forgiveness. You're absolutely right. And you didn't deserve the forgiveness of Jesus. And neither did I. Probably as far as I'm concerned, more than any of you. Let there be no more resentment, no more anger or temper, no more violent self-assertiveness, no more slander, no more malicious remarks. Be kind to each other. Be understanding. Here we go. And be as ready to forgive others as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Maybe I'm wrong on this. I don't think I am. Forgiveness has nothing to do with what's happened to you. Forgiveness is all about what has been done for you. And so you focus on the one who's done so much for you. And when you forgive, you release them into his hands. Nobody gets away. Nobody walks away free. God's eyes go to and fro on the earth, beholding the good and the evil. Nothing escapes his notice. But we sang a song earlier about God wanting us to be free. God wants you to be free. And when you and I walk in unforgiveness, we're bound. It's like carrying a weight. And I'm sure it's been said here or in other places that you've been at, but forgiveness, unforgiveness rather, is the same thing as you drinking poison waiting for me to die. It won't happen. And I would think in an audience this large, you can't have this many people in here who haven't done things that you're still haunted by. Things that every once in a while come and bite you. Things that drive you into a pit. You could be driving your car and all of a sudden you're having a great day listening to music and all of a sudden you think about something that happened back there that you did. And then all of a sudden, how many people have ever been there? I know this might sound crazy, but it has worked for me. Maybe today, if that's you, 
service is over, you go home, go in the bathroom, close the door behind yourself, stand in the mirror and point at that person and just say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I choose to forgive you. Because you and I can't change anything that's back there. You and I can't undo anything that's back there. The only thing that we can do with that is learn from it in the hopes that we won't go there again or the hopes that somebody else won't go there again. But you live in a world that's broken and there are gonna be people always showing up with their issues. How are you and I gonna deal with them? What's going to be our attitude when these knuckleheads show up in our lives? How many of you drive a car? How many of you have been cut off by somebody? How many of you wanted to lay hands on that person? <laughs> or how many of you commended them for their driving? You're number one, but you weren't using that finger. <laughs> Say neighbor. neighbor. Don't act like you don't know what that brother's talking about. <laughs> What's going to be our attitude? We forgive others. That day, last thought, when that woman said, what kind of a mother did you have? I took a ride, and I thought about that. And I had two mothers, and they both messed up, they messed up my life. Betty, when she was impregnated at 15 years old by my real father, who was 25 years old, went to have me aborted. And the lady who did illegal abortions at that time talked her out of doing the abortion. And that lady became my godmother. And that lady gave her life to Jesus. And in the year 2000, I officiated her funeral. And she could have buried me in 1947, and God gave me the honor of burying her in the year 2000. What an incredible God we serve. So I ran in the car. I thought about it, and these, this is what happened. My two moms, they messed my life up. They're both dead, and I'm still angry. Betty died when I was 20 years old at 35 years old. These words came out of my mouth. I would think it was tantamount to the way they spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost. Mommy, I forgive you. Betty, I forgive you. Father, forgive me for everything I've allowed that to cause me to become. And a weight came off of me that I never knew I was carrying. And I was free of that. We're carrying weights, folks, and God wants you to be free. Life is not fair. Life stinks at times, but God is fair, whether we understand it or not, because the scripture says, shall not the judge of the earth judge fairly. God goes, I got this. That if we come to him, we get real with him, we get honest with him. We become vulnerable and transparent with him. This is what I've seen. Our lives will never be the same. That God is crazy about you. That God wants to reveal himself to that world through you. Some of it will happen in this building. Most of it will happen outside of this building. The world has to see something in you that they themselves don't have. And it's Jesus. Say neighbor. Amen. All that being said, are you ready to forgive? Okay, let's pray. Here's what I would ask you to do. Just close your eyes. Whatever resonated with you today, and if nothing resonated with you today, if nothing was important for you today, maybe this message wasn't for you today, then I ask that you would intercede in prayer for others, just quietly, that God would bring about healing and enablement to forgive. As I'm sharing this, this is one thing I feel God wants me to share. Just keep your eyes closed. When you've been wounded, there's a scar. And you can forgive, but the wound is still there. 
and it needs to be healed. We hear the expression that time heals all wounds. This is what I believe. Time doesn't heal anything. The Lord says, I am the Lord God that heals you. He just uses time to do it. So if the wound is still there and you've said the words in your heart, Lord, I forgive this person, give God the time to heal that wound. So Father, we thank you today. I thank you for these, my brothers and sisters. I thank you for a right attitude that comes through our submission to the Holy Spirit. Moved by your spirit in our hearts, our minds, our lives, do in us whatever you desire to do. Build, up us, build us up, make us whole. Let us not be like Jacob when he heard that Joseph was dead, though he wasn't, where he said, and Jacob refused to be comforted. Let us not refuse the comfort that comes from your spirit. We thank you for that today, Lord God. We choose today to forgive others. We choose to forgive ourselves. We choose to receive your forgiveness of us and your demonstration of love through that forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.